Thank you. 
apologize for that performance in a way. I, I'm not so good at playing. I, I taught for too many hours before I played that. Yeah. But anyway, uh, is this it? Is everyone? So uh, what we're going to do today uh, is have some fun with the excerpts, and um, uh, I've, I've asked that the participants play uh, one excerpt of their choice, and then uh, one excerpt from my excerpt uh, practice books, and I want to relate uh, hopefully a number of things um, that we encounter um, two things that are in the practice book so that um, you can understand uh, more fully what is uh, going on there. So it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit about the practice books and what I'm doing with that. I also want to say something about the other books, which is a tone development series you can find over here as well. But um, I do very much want to um, keep the focus on the performers and their performance, and that's the most important thing we're doing here today. Um, so without further ado, who's first? Okay, Lila, great. Okay, let's welcome Lila. So that, is, that will show very well for you in, in any audition. You sound like a principal flute player. Uh, so uh, beyond that, um, uh, there are some aspects of that that, that uh, a conductor or audition committee may take issue with a couple of different things. And I just want to point them out. I, these are things that I want you to think about. 
Um, and they, a lot of these things, when it comes down to it, it kind of has to do with the, uh, you know, the nitpicky details, because she really does have it. I mean, she has the voice. Uh, she has her sound. Um, and so it's going to come down to those kinds of things. Say you make it to the next round of the audition, then it's going to be more picky about the exact things that you are doing as compared to what somebody else is doing. Um, but anyway, our first duty, I think, always uh, to the composer is to try to bring to life the things that are both in the score and the things that are not in the score. Because composers have many choices. And we have to trust that the things that have come down to us through history in these pieces, that mostly we have it right. You will find differences in scores and parts, of course, that can always cause confusion and problems. But, um, in this case, I don't think there's anything um, in the score which uh, shouldn't be there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I would like you to uh, adhere more strictly to the diminuendo that is printed at the beginning. It has so much to do with the form and with the with the mood itself. So the challenge there, of course, is can you start really soft? in that scale coming down there, and then can you stay soft and still get a little bit softer because that's what you're being challenged to do. Uh, I think you make too much of a crescendo okay. in, in that somewhere. Um, maybe just start soft and let it come down. In the, in the mood, uh, the mood of the piece is coming down to a more calm uh, point in general. Maybe the calmest point, isn't it? If you know the piece, this is sort of the, the bottom of the ocean, so to speak, you know? Mm -hmm. So let me hear, I love the way that you play it. The legato is so good, but I don't want you to make any crescendo in there okay. at all. Okay, one more time, right there, okay? One, two. be as showy in a soloistic sense, but uh, an audition committee, I think, will respect that more because it really is correct, and that is the way, that's kind of the way the piece really goes <laughs> at that point, you know? And frankly, the, uh, the, the second parts are more interesting there, the second wind parts are more interesting than the first, first parts anyway. Maybe the first parts should be underplayed a tiny bit, right? You don't have the harmony part yeah. there, which is which is kind of the more interesting thing that's going on there. Anyway, then when you get to the solo, is there a way that you can sort of blend into solo voice without making a big deal out of it? Maybe just in the first couple of notes. I kind of like to do this way. too loud at the beginning anyway, are you? I don't think that you were. Anyway, but um, see if you can play that little, with, little game with this excerpt when you get to the solo. See if you can sort of disguise the fact that you are the solo voice, but you don't really want to announce that rudely, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, and you can do it subtly that way. There's no, nothing in orchestration to cover your, your sound there. Can you just show me that, if you would? Maybe just the measure before the 3-2, if you would. Exactly. 
something like that. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the way to do it. I think it works well okay. in orchestra. And um, the rest, I thought, I thought you did pretty well. You know, there's one basic challenge with the solo I think we all have to confront um, is the fact that it goes louder, lower at the end. Mm -hmm. You know, it could have been written so it was easier <laughs> than, than that. Um, but the, uh, the crescendo which occurs in that measure, I'm talking about measure 103, any of you are looking on uh, that crescendo towards the end, that is there for compositional uh, reasons, um, having to do with the structure of the melody, that, the, that, uh, that crescendo actually kind of has to be there. But I can give you a little gimmick if you're um, having trouble with it or worried about it, as I have been at different points in my career, um, there's a little gimmick which is in uh, 102, in the measure before, actually play a little bit softer. Okay. Then you will be able to do the crescendo a little better. So. Show me that if you would, okay? Let's go from this spot, nice and full here, right? Do it again, but try not to add any accents. I'm hearing a little bit of this business. Uh, try not to bump along in there. Yeah, and keep maybe keep your emotions um, very much on the continuum here, if you would. That's going to help. Should be subtitling like that for auditions are going to be picky about the rhythm right okay so accepted fact of auditioning okay do your stuff but do it in time okay that's the recipe for success okay. yeah might as well just accept it that's what happens um, and uh, anyway I think that you sounded Fabulous, right there, and I really, I actually really love the way you play this. I, I, yeah, yeah, and she has really good, lega beautiful legato and full voice um, with that. I like, I like the way you use your vibrato too. I think it's very appropriate to the style Thank of you this. Much. It's really quite passionate sounding, and uh, I like your intensity as well. It's going to suit you very well. So just a few of those little things right there. Do be careful about accenting in the phrase, accenting apostaturas or, or whatever. Probably not the best idea for this. Okay, shall we move on? Sure. Okay, so now I have uh, Leonor, right? And this is the fast solo, right? Yes. Okay, good. personality that you're you're bringing to it um, so uh, you know obviously um, you know the solo quite well I'm sure everybody everybody here uh, knows this solo quite well probably practicing it a lot um, 
And we always have to prepare the solo for auditions and sometimes for performances, uh, if you're lucky enough to play it in orchestra. Have you played it in orchestra? No, I've never played it in orchestra. Okay, all right. Well, I think the day will come for you, <laughs> okay. uh, if you keep it up that way. Um, and um, there's a, a number of aspects of this that um, are important because I think that um, you know, or orchestra committees really want to find out your skill level in, in some ways, and that is sort of a snapshot, if you will, of many important flute playing skills, as, as we all know. Uh, it's quite a difficult excerpt in, in a number of ways, as are most of Beethoven's pieces. Um, and uh, one, one thing um, that is um, really important in this excerpt is this business of the triplets, okay? And that's a place, I think, where we all have to really focus all of our skills uh, in, in very particular ways, you know? So uh, say that you, one day that you, you, you practice, uh, practice the excerpt slowly with a metronome, and you sort of get it to the point where you want it to be, and then you move on, you have more excerpts to work on or more repertoire, whatever. Um, maybe the next day, um, you don't necessarily want to go through the same process, and you don't want to do the same process day after day. It gets stale, you're going to get tired of it, and lose your inspiration. Uh, and I think many of us who, who are doing auditions, um, and even those of us who have orchestra jobs who play these pieces all the time, um, I think getting tired of them, burnout, getting bad habits, uh, going and stuff like that. It's a common problem in our business. We all have to face it uh, somehow. Um, and that's why, that's one reason that I have written um, these, uh, the series of practice books here. And um, I wanted to call attention to this triplet passage in particular. So uh, we can go to, you know, to that section um, of the book, and this would be maybe an alternative way of practicing it, okay. you know, the next day, so that you can work on, you can still work on it and continue to improve, but that um, maybe you don't need to practice it the same way over and over again. One way of doing it um, is to work on one aspect which is particularly problematic. One thing I notice issue that you have is very common for many of us. We have to make sure we can connect the notes in the triplets. And I'm talking about this little business of connecting these notes with the slur, I think is kind of difficult for everybody. Uh, I mean, I've heard so many flute players play this excerpt, and I can tell you that is challenging for everybody. I don't think I don't think that your slurs were quite what I would want them to be. I don't know how you felt about it, whether that's something that you go for or something. Is that challenging for you, something you think about, or do you just sort um, of not worry about that part? I think usually around that section, I'm kind of like struggling for air, and I need to so get breathing. ready to play that long note, so um, it's hard to find somewhere to breathe, and then I end up dropping yeah. stuff and not yeah. phrasing correctly. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, addressing the breathing, which um, I also do address in the comments uh, for this. Um, it's usually just a matter of breathing fast. Um, usually, uh, at just a lot of us end up breathing at that point. Um, there's nothing wrong with it if you can do it very fast. Um, but if you take a little bit too much time to do it, you'll find it's quite dangerous in the orchestra. 
to do that, the conductor might not like it very much. Um, and, uh, you know, there's no substitute for, um, for there's, in terms of breathing, for using your air wisely, measuring out the volume of air only as much as you need. Um, so a general solution might be a larger breath in 335, larger breath in 339, okay? Like as, and I'm talking like as much air as you can take, you know? Uh, and then you're gonna have a little bit more air there in this measure as, as well in 342, uh, a little breath there. Then maybe you don't have to play so loud. After that, you might find that you're in better shape towards the end, if you have that kind of strategy. Yeah. So definitely, yes, breathing is a, a very important aspect. Um, but I did want to just call your attention to one of these exercises for, uh, for connecting the downward slur. Um, and you can practice, for example, in this one exercise, just working with that whole idea of the downward slurs, for example, maybe this one as well. Which basically is going to give you, give you uh, like an aerobic exercise for the whole technique of connecting downward slurs, you probably would want to start quite slowly, maybe just on one section of it, and then gradually sort of increase the tempo. You can change, you can transpose the octaves as well, um, so it gets more in the range of the actual solo. Okay. Um, and that's just one example of how you might use this, then maybe the next day you go back to actually try to perform the, the excerpt, and may, or maybe you find a different, um, a different challenge in the excerpt that you really want to address, which you can find some exercises for in the book as well. So these are ways to sort of just keep the, the work fresh, um, to keep you sort of grounded, going back to fundamentals in your playing all the time as you are working on the, the excerpts. And that's sort of what I'm going for uh, there. So that's just an example of what how, how you might use a book. I really like that because I do get bored playing it over and over again. Well, we do, you know, and we, um, sometimes we do find something that works very well. And that is a very good thing. If you find something that works really well, try to find several things that work really well uh, to keep you from just having so much repetition. Um, and, uh, you know, the exercises in these books can be sort of a launching pad for your own work, developing your own things. There, all, Some of them are, most of the things in there are things that I have developed over the years just to sort of keep myself uh, really on task with the thing without getting too tired of it, you know, playing it over and over again. And we all do have that issue, so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But I loved hearing you sound good.
test at F. Uh, I'll play the English horn part. And you may find you have to make some subtle adjustments. We'll try to take the same tempo. I'll play at F. Okay, ready? This phrasing business uh, on 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 met on um, in, on page twenty two um, that I think I'm trying to show with numerical ranking uh, all how the notes are all compared um, and this is a technique that I I actually like to use which was sort of taught to me um, but here you can sit if you even if you're playing exactly in time. The, um, the sextuplet that maybe the thing to do is reduce the volume a little bit more so it just sort of those sort of kind of fade a little bit and that kind of allows for the action in the English horn that kind of action in the middle of the measure you are actually at that for that beat, you are actually more out of the way, yet you're playing quite rhythmically. Uh, and that's the kind of chamber music that you're dealing with. Um, if, you, if you have the book and you're studying this phrasing uh, section that I'm, I'm talking about here, I've tried to be quite specific about the numerical uh, scale because it's that type of chamber music, you know, where, where uh, you have sort of a rapidly, subtly changing uh, central role, so to speak. So your ear should be drawn to the English horn, and then in the next beat should be drawn to the flute a little bit. English horn, flute, English horn, flute. This way, this kind of thing. Uh, and that's why I think it has to be so, so detailed. I think you could shade a little bit more. Let's just work on that for a second, if you would. Just starting here, come back, reduce a little bit more in the middle of the measures, if you would. Okay? And one. Nice. nice, nice. Exactly, right. And that is what, that kind of work is what you're going to reflect there. Hey, I think that your playing of this is really, really professional uh, 
level. Um, I'm wondering whether articulation is a little bit heavy. I think it can be lighter for Rossini, can't it? Uh, really focus D natural. I think that's better. What uh, Sometimes what happens uh, when we uh, articulate the embouchure aperture gets a little bigger. And uh, that can contribute to you sort of having to use more air to produce the tone, and therefore everything starts to get a little bit heavier. So when you want to make things lighter, try to get the embouchure aperture smaller, and leave, try to leave it there while the tongue is activated. And don't use uh, too much of your tongue to, to articulate the note. Try to just get everything sort of in, in front, up in front, not too much da 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 kind of a little bit more forward. That's the way I do it. Um, and always work from uh, a really focused tone. So, uh, and you can find also this kind of work in the book, which, um, which you may want to refer back to uh, in this section, um, which would be a little more um, this idea of maybe lengthening some of the notes. So if you're practicing some of these fragments, little thing, you can work on really getting the D natural exactly where you want it to be. you need to find exactly always sort of using the denatural as sort of a, a focal point for the entire thing. Maybe this exercise right here is good. Uh, gradually speeding that up, that kind of thing, to give you that uh, maybe some of the a little bit more tonal focus and therefore a little more delicacy all the way through, which is kind of what I thought you could have used um, in the, uh, throughout the whole thing, but yeah, definitely um, in this section as well. Uh, maybe go for a tone production was a little smaller, um, a little more accurate accuracy of direction for each note. Very, very accurate placement of all the notes. It sounds a little too general, which is a big sound. He has a big sound that's going to project in, in the big hall. You won't have that issue. That's, that's great. I think you have to try to get it a little bit more Rossini-ish, mm -hmm. which is going to be just a little smaller, uh, more dolce, a little more dolce in the thing. See if we can uh, improve that right now. Maybe, how about a little slower? And a little more focused overall. Do a dee da dee da dee da da dee da dee da maybe? Maybe not so loud. Really yeah, that's, I think that's getting better. And um, there's a number of ways that you can also work on um, that passage in this book. Um, not always articulated when we're talking about like tone and articulation, that intersection. Sometimes if we have an articulation problem, it's not an articulation problem, it's a tone problem. In fact, most of the time. Uh, it's a basic air direction kind of thing. Um, but I think that's the right direction, not quite so rough. Um, maybe, I don't know, sometimes I get the feeling that you're stopping the air so completely that 
I'm not sure if it's creating a choppy sort of feel. You kind of do want a shortness to it, but without maybe without being too 20th century about it, you know. I get a feeling you're in this direction. Which I think is too harsh. It's too short. Uh, Also, a little bit of that treatment uh, we could use for the beginning phrases, even. I don't know. Uh, it sounded a little bit ungainly. So, can you play one more time? I want to move on to the other excerpt. But. a little more dolce quality. It sounds a little bit in this direction. Which is quite uh, classical, I suppose. Yeah, you're, I think your tone is in here, so it has romantic uh, intentions. <laughs> you know? And I think you want to keep this really quite, really quite classical. Well, maybe that some of the tone exercises um, in the beginning, I think you could do a little bit more, maybe with those, just to get it all right in a little bit tighter package, you know, sure. in, in terms of the tone. So maybe going that direction uh, with these. Okay, shall we move on to our next? Okay, good. And what was it, Salomon? Yes. Yeah, okay. Good. of your the the first e natural 
Uh, again, I'm feeling like it's a little bit rough the way you're handling the tone. Um, maybe just take a little off of the edge, try to, or maybe try to form the vowel a little bit more so that the tone is a little bit more sort of uh, beguiling. It sounds a little uh, in this direction. Maybe use your vibrato to communicate the strength in it, but maybe don't push the sound. Make sure that uh, that you are constant. Whenever we go to uh, from G to E flat, it's a it's a little bit of a dangerous um, part of that arpeggio, C minor or uh, E flat major, descending to E flat. Make sure you don't crack the E flat, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Make sure you have the air figured out there. Generally, for E flat, maybe the air uh, not quite as fast as for G. It's really, okay. it has to be a, quite a difference between the two, okay. right? And that will uh, hopefully keep you from cracking the E-flat, but that was good this time. Uh, it sounds a little unstable, mm -hmm. right, at the top. Can you, can you do better yeah. with the, with the C-sharp? I think you, you, you did better before. Uh, how about right here? Usually it's stylized a little bit more B, but la di, da la di, da la. delay your triplets just a little bit further. I know it's risky, but uh, I think that's usually the tradition okay. of that. Yeah, big la di, da la di, quite fast if you can, okay. right there. Maybe the last one, maybe the last one a tiny bit slower. But I think that's in the middle of the okay. measure. I think that's the way okay. it has to go. And then um, I was looking for my, I actually have a flute accompaniment part that I wrote to this, but I don't, I didn't bring it, I suppose. But uh, I'm not sure that at F that you can speed up like that, you know? And I'm, I'm really afraid like some crabby person on the audition committee is gonna, well, they, they rush, mm -hmm. you know, or something like that. You know, they always try to find some something like that. You know, uh, so maybe be conservative at F. It's going to take all your lung power for sure. Mm -hmm. But um, a lot of times that a lot of times that passage uh, is actually in time. It's just very very slow and sort of accompanimental mm -hmm. in a way. But um, yeah, I th and, but I thought the rest of it was. Uh, this is a really good really good excerpt for you. It's really strong, and I think the way that you're using your tone uh, is really perfect for it. Um, again, in ge just in general, in terms of the sound, maybe using your, you know, using your recorder. Question is, what's what you've you've you're such an accomplished player, uh, and you have such a great sound. What's next for you in tone development? You know, where are you going? With this, what do you really want? You know that you feel that you don't have. You know, what's it possible for you to do that you haven't done yet? You know, and uh, I think we always have to be curious. We have to be driven by these questions. What's better for me? I know what I'm doing now, but where are the weak points? Where have I still not got it? I think you can have. You should have a little bit more vowel development, especially in the front, the vowel to me in front, it looks not quite 
not quite shaped or formed enough. Usually we like to have ooh, ooh, something like that going on in front and then as you are doing quite quite open and spacious in back like we're yawning oh, like, like that but in front a little bit more funnel shaped funnel going into the embouchure okay. aperture and I think that's going to give your tone that sort of prettiness that I want it I want it to have I have the fullness and everything okay. maybe investigate that but I, I think you're a fantastic flute player yeah it's really good yeah. thank you bravo Which one do you want to play first? Um, I don't mind either way. Um, it's up to you. I'll start with Paul's. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, play. play. Sorry. No, 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 <laughs> Before play. I hit no, the no, double. You. You've been sitting there freezing for. style sound at least for the states you could you could look for sort of more bass in in your sound the size of the sound I feel needs a little bit uh, of development uh, that you know I mean and that is a complex rather complex issue um, you don't want to lose the focus and pitch definition that you have and that vowel, that very sweet sort of vowel that you get. You don't want to lose that. Mm -hmm. um, it's very attractive. Um, maybe you could work with uh, a little bit lower jaw position. Um, just more slack with the jaw altogether. Now, when I say slack, I'm not talking about 
like pulling your jaw in different directions and making your jaw into another position or something because you're only going to hurt yourself. Uh, the jaw does not like do, to be messed with. Okay, All you can do is release all the stuff around it. So the cheek muscles, um, you know, the joint, the muscles in the joint back here, if they're too tight, if you're holding onto the sound from back here, you need to maybe figure out a way to, to just let go of that. Um, and uh, that will probably increase what I increase maybe uh, the sort of the chamber at the top of the throat back of the mouth we want that chamber to be relaxed natural and open not impeded or anything uh, sometimes uh, the tongue position is weird back there for various reasons we try to direct the air with the back of the tongue by raising it. If you're doing that, you need to figure out a way to release, to let go. That's usually related to the jaw, though, as well. The tongue is doing that because of the tense jaw kind of thing, so you kind of have a, a little bit of chicken in the egg uh, with that sometimes. And these are complex issues that teachers don't like to talk about uh, too much. Um, but though those are ways to increase the size of the sound. Um, not so sure, um, and I know I'm, I'm sorry to be laying into you about this, and I don't, I don't mean to, uh, for it to sound that way. I'm just uh, saying that in terms of tone development, um, that is the direction that I think that you need to go. It's fairly clear. Absolutely. Yeah, you feel also? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, okay, all right. So, yeah, I mean, that's good. Um, and uh, also, um, jaw position, I don't, I don't want to stay on it forever. It's a fundamental, very fundamental thing, though, um, that I have found that uh, posture and jaw position are closely related. So one, one thing we do, especially when we try to focus the tone or play soft, is we have a little bit of this kind of thing going on. So this is kind of very forward, like this. But unfortunately, other things are forward too. So she's a little forward here with the pelvis, and she's a little forward here. So you're a little too curved, like from the side, a little bit like a yeah. backward C, <laughs> if you would. And you have a little bit of that going on. And that is enough to keep your jaw from slackening. If you go forward from here, you'll notice you cannot you cannot slacken your jaw. You have to have you have to have your head uh, balanced on top of your spine in order for everything to relax enough for your jaw to just sort of drop down and let go. And uh, the more I think about it, the more I think that that is sort of the uh, saboteur um, in the soup with the jaw is that it's a head position thing. Right, make sure you, you, you're open back here when you play at the top uh, base of your base of your skull in back right, right here that this is open. Tuck your chin in a tiny bit. Yes, oh, like that. Right, it, that move. Right, and that's very subtle. Mm -hmm. A little bit like a bird, you know. This kind of thing. Okay, just a little bit. Don't do it too much. Don't, don't overdo it or you're going to close your throat. But um, that will help you with the size of your sound. It also is generally makes it easier for her to blow down, which is another uh, ingredient of having that sort of dark, rich richness to the sound, is having the general angle of the air a little bit oriented so it falls Mm -hmm. falls down into the flute a little more rapidly as you're blowing, you know. All right, so that's the way I see it uh, in terms of your tone development. Um, go, maybe go experiment with her, speak to your teacher about it or whatever, but in my experience, that, that's what I think. 
And um, so, yeah, she, so she's actually playing uh, playing the solo from this book, which is in this uh, my Exploring Sound series. And uh, this is something I've toyed with my whole career, which is the uh, first time I sat in orchestra, I, I heard the horn player play this melody that I thought was just so cool, and I thought, well, why can't I play it? You know, well, it's because I don't have it written down anywhere, and I can't transpose well enough <laughs> from the score. So I'd go home, and I'd get the score, and I, wow, I really want to play the horn solo. And then I'd try to transpose it and turn the pages and everything. So I finally started, you know, just with just a piece of manuscript paper, just transposing them and writing them down. Mm -hmm. So I could go home and play the the other person's solo, you know, <laughs> and um, it's just something I fooled around with my whole career. And I realized, wow, I mean, some of the solos for the other instruments are so challenging on flute. And then I get to some of the flute passages, and I think, oh, that's so easy now, <laughs> you know, or something like that. Or if you just want to get to know the piece, uh, it's it's a great way to get to know the piece. So you can play all the violin melodies and all the other solos from the other instruments in every key, transposed in every key, in this book and in the other uh, books in the series. So if you like that thing too, um, then make sure you check those out. Because um, I finally decided to just start writing it all out for flute players. I think it's kind of what Moise wanted to do uh, is some of that um, with tone development mm -hmm. uh, with his book um, it's just that opera stuff was very popular at that time so he was writing down opera aria melodies for flute players to play yeah, yeah. you know um, but I really do think it's a it's an incredibly creative and fun super fun way to develop your tone uh, it's good to go back to de la sonorite and the chromatic scales that's good Mm -hmm. Don't abandon that. It's very good, careful work. Mm -hmm. But make sure you apply what you learn there to a lot of different kinds of melodies. Um, I'm always inquisitive about how to play melodies. What's, mm -hmm. what's it like this way? What's it like this way? I, I, I'm just fascinated by mm -hmm. all that kind of thing. But it get, increases your perspective um, on everything you play. So I highly recommend that and sometimes playing the things in the other keys. Sometimes you play it in an easier key, mm -hmm. and you wish the composer had written it in that key. Mm -hmm. And then other times <laughs> you can find some super difficult keys to play things in, and you come back to the solo and you think, "Oh, it's so easy," you know, that kind of thing. Um, so anyway, that's a little bit what we're after here. Anyway, um, I thought your playing of this was really fabulous. I liked what you did here. Uh, in measure 102. Let's just make sure we do that really tight in yeah. the rhythm. Let's not distract from the rhythm there. Let's just try that one thing. Maybe, can you, maybe from here, run up to it. Continue to develop your sound with the solo and the other things in the book um, to, you know, just continue to get to know the piece, increase your perspective on the whole piece altogether. Believe me, somehow it, it, you play the solo better okay. if you know the other passages in the piece better. And I don't know how that is, but I can tell you that it's a real thing. But uh, that's really fantastic, the, the way you play that. Make sure you don't come up here. Uh, we ha always have to stay down on that one, so... Uh that one is down, okay. uh, on purpose, yeah. by the composer. And then that prepares you for the little crescendo mm. 
that's coming up. That could be a little bit more of a feature yeah. in the way that you're playing. I want to move on, but I, I do want to hear that. Maybe just if you would right here, please. Good risk, good <laughs> risk. You can do better. One more time. as a way of sort of defining the construction yeah. of the phrase as a three-part group, and then you go from there. And uh, I think it's very intelligently done. Beautiful. Okay, good. And now to the <laughs> lead one. Good. <laughs> such a good sense about that in your playing. I really like it. It's, it's very, very good. And she sort of does have this uh, classical thing going on here. Uh, the sense, sort of a sense of uh, proportion mm. and perspective to the whole thing. You know, Mozart really could have written that. Um, the, uh, Mozart probably would not have written the triplet passage. He would have skipped Right, right to the, he would have yeah. skipped over it, <laughs> basically left it out. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, but other than that, I think Mozart probably, probably would have been quite happy to say that he wrote that. It's, it's a good piece of chamber music. Um, and uh, you have, with that, that triplet passage again, you do sort of have, uh, let's hear that again, you sort of have that bouncy quality. Yeah, that's nice. Connect your slurs, connect your slurs now. Connect. I'm not so convinced yeah. <laughs> by that connection. And this, everybody be super careful about that. It sounds a little bit separated mm. as you're descending on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, there's a, a number of uh, exercises yeah, yeah. in the book that you can work on to work on your downward slurs because you sort of have to it's how you manage the air so it's like uh, smooth and connected hopping louder note a little louder a lower note a little louder than upper note right? hopping To the lower note, yeah. which is the part we don't we don't like to do. We don't we don't like to blow into the lower notes very much. Um, you have to make the embouchure aperture a little larger mm -hmm. in order to accommodate that. Can okay. you do it slow once? I don't want to torture you with it, but it's simple. Yeah. <laughs> 
in other words, this is a way you actually make the passage harder and harder in the exercise. And as you do that, then the excerpt gets easier and easier. Okay? <laughs> you just need a harder exercise in order to, to work on it instead of just working on that. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And that's the sort of broadening of perspective that I'm trying to, to get at. And then I promise when you come back to it, it's going to be easier. It, it works. It, it, you got to believe me, it works. Just one little thing before we stop that I want you to do, which is maybe superimpose. You can find it uh, back here in the phrasing uh, business. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, <coughs> I mean, yeah. you don't need to find it exactly, but um, oh, that's, that's okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, that's the other excerpt. Oh, There's yeah. three excerpts in here. Oh, that's yeah, why sorry, the book is so darn big. <laughs> um, but um, here. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's all right. We can we can find it later. But what what I'm getting at is that I think that you actually have to intensify mm. the dynamic discreetly, in order to sort of subversively. Here. Uh, in order to get that pianissimo to be um, very a, a very important feature, mm -hmm. so maybe uh, uh, give a little crescendo. Yeah. Yeah, it's just mm -hmm. right here that you need uh, you need just a little bit more sound. Can you maybe right here? your intonation is slightly screwed up mm -hmm. by that, but I, that, I think that's what you have to do yeah. to get your... Right here. <laughs> bravo, bravo!
let's let's put you under the gun here. I'm gonna I'll play the English horn and let's really try to play together. Okay. okay. Yeah. Just for the rhythm. Okay. I'll start at F. Yeah. So you have the pedal tone, and uh, they have the moving voice. Mm -hmm. So if you delay your vibrato or you surge on your long note, you sort of step on their toes, okay. so to speak. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So then, uh, the, so then, probably in terms of chamber music, the appropriate way is to directly vibrate a little bit right when you arrive at your long note, and then maybe stay a little more passive. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, so they can do the arpeggios. Let's just try that right at, right at the end. You delay there a little bit. Did you hear it? Yeah, I'm going to I think it's a habit. <laughs> I want you to vibrate right away on that long note if possible. That's great. That's right. This is very appropriate. If I hear that in audition, I think, oh, that's going to work for the chamber music quite nicely. It means that you are kind of aware mm -hmm. of your role at that point. And I think communicating awareness of role in auditions is really a thing. Uh, and you think, well, how much can I prove I'm just playing alone? But and actually, you're playing for people who know the pieces pretty well, mm -hmm. usually. And um, by these kinds of little things, sometimes they make a judgment about your level of experience uh, based on that. Mm -hmm. you know? So uh, always awareness of role, of the bigger, bigger perspective of how you fit in and using dynamics and things like that articulation appropriately uh, for those things. Uh, it says quite a bit about, about you as a player. Did you find that you had to adjust very much when I was playing the other part? Um, yeah, this bit, always. 
yeah. fitting those notes in feel like it happens much faster. Uh -huh. when you're playing with the four. Yeah, that's right. You, you, it, it becomes sort of a really different thing. I think it's an excerpt that's so much uh, easier to play by yourself in an audition than to play uh, in the orchestra. And, and usually, so usually you have the conductor up there, you never know exactly what they're going to do. And, um, and then the English horn player is oftentimes all the way over there. Mm -hmm. So it can be really uh, quite a juggling act mm -hmm. to, to get it together. The last time we did it, um, I asked if maybe the English horn player could move over to the principal oboe chair, and they did. They changed, and it was so much easier. Oh my gosh, it was <laughs> easier than ever. You know, we we just loved it. Um, but uh, um, fantastic, very 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 good. I wanted to make a little bit um, of a point about um, phrasing in the opening melody. I think it's very important. So um, simplicity in the melody is, I think it's a very tangible element mm -hmm. of this melody, that it's not impassioned. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think in that, that has that, a little bit of that sort of cla classicism uh, to it. Um, but I, I think you want to avoid, again, with the vibrato habits, introducing the vibrato too late in the note, too often will it will create um, sort of ungainly surges mm -hmm. in your phrasing. Okay. So uh, not so much like this. Which I think is a little bit, it's a little overblown, mm -hmm. you know, too impassioned. You know, okay. like you are talking very loud like this, you know, in, in the melody, mm -hmm. you know. And I think we want to keep it beautiful and very sort of proportional. I would recommend, again, maybe to start the vibrato directly on the beginning of the note. Mm -hmm. And if you, uh, if you go to the, the uh, phrasing section that I've, I've tried to illustrate with this melody, mm -hmm. uh, I've tried to sketch out very carefully detailed in numbers mm -hmm. how you can create this sort of energy flow in, the, in this. So you kind of have this little circular mm -hmm. action returning to the downbeat. And I think it keeps it simple and, okay. and straightforward. Can you try it? Mm -hmm. OK. And pure sound as well. Start your vibrato right away. Somehow we have to have enough air. Uh, you're doing a good job with uh, air management on that. I think with the little grace notes, they're an important part of playing the last note mm -hmm. is including the grace notes as sort of a little bit of a vault jumping into the last note. Make sure your grace notes are full enough in sound and enough air volume to support your last note. Mm -hmm. so. And then your last note, a little longer than you dare. A little longer than. Usually mm -hmm. that's the way it's played. I don't know why, it's just very traditional. Usually they don't cut you off uh -huh. uh, on this note. It's mm -hmm. usually supposed to be a little bit longer. Uh, and. Unfortunately, with what I'm describing, it makes it a little bit more difficult mm -hmm. to, to play the excerpt. Um, and uh, I think uh, you also want to delay, in terms of phrasing, we're getting quite uh, picky on the phrasing, I apologize, but uh, maybe to uh, not increase too much here because the chord has, the chord has not changed. This is one of those melodies that only Rossini could write. There's mm -hmm. the G major chord, and it seems to just stay and stay and stay in the phrase, and you always think it's going to change. 
but it doesn't change. Mm -hmm. It stays the same. And at the last minute, it changes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so kind of try to tail your, tail, tailor your phrasing a little bit to that. It's not earlier, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and in the book, you can also, if you investigate, I've uh, sketched out the, the simplified version of the melody with the harmony, mm -hmm. uh, reduced uh, harmony, so you can actually see exactly where the chord changes are. And it, I think it informs your phrasing. It's quite possible to get it quite detailed and subtle in terms of, in terms of the phrasing. Can you get your articulation a little more focused and delicate mm -hmm. in this passage? Really as beautiful focus, beautiful articulation is what I want to hear. started to increase, if I can be super critical, I would say that um, it becomes um, a little bit too punchy mm -hmm. in the use of the tonguey. Okay. Uh, and if you can use the tongue just a little bit lighter, maybe use the air a little bit, ha, 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 just a gentle sort of pulse the air a little bit, mm -hmm. and use the tongue lightly. It sounds a little bit too heavy. Mm -hmm. The proportion of tone to sound of tongue mm -hmm. is, I think, a little bit off. Okay. You know, maybe to a little bit to the, I don't know, 20th century or even 21st century. I don't know what. But uh, try to stay a little more Mozartian. to the English horn at the bottom, mm -hmm. maybe come out a little bit. Can you just lighten this up for me just a little bit here? Delicate. Yeah, in chamber music, I think you would say, please, your turn for the melody. You know. Very good, okay, fantastic. Yeah, very nice things, yeah. Okay, let's move on.
fresh, really, very nice. It's a little bit hard to, to criticize um, much about that, um, but I, to be super picky, I do think uh, at 177, I think you lost the rhythm. Uh, you, you should really check that. Uh, mm -hmm. You mean going into 177? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think uh, that skipped speed or something. I think it was too long. Can you try it? I just want to check you on it. Uh, maybe D da D da going to C sharp there. D. Yeah, it, you're, ti you're a little tiny bit late. Okay. Uh, that time I felt like you're still delaying just a little bit, and I did also uh, to be super critical. I did feel the same. Uh, you know at Retenu, Légèrement? Yeah. Uh, I didn't feel like the, I could really track the... Did you run out of air? Yeah, I completely ran, ran out of breath, air. yeah. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. But look, um, other than that, I think your rhythm uh, is very good, and as you all know, it's so important uh, in your audition that you show good pulse, sense of pulse, good expression and sense of pulse. At the same time, uh, it's absolutely crucial um, and uh, it's much easier in orchestra and way funner mm -hmm. to play in, mm -hmm. in orchestra, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then the conductors usually, either they let you do your own thing or they bring something to it that's really special, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and so it can be very, such fun. I, I love to play it in orchestra. It's great. I don't like to play it in auditions, so. but... Uh, <laughs> So one thing he did, which is so great, um, and I have I have a couple of the notes here in a flute part that I sketched out, uh, but um, uh, is this? Can you can you begin? Uh, would you mind uh, begin one more time with your scale? I'm just going to play a few notes while you play. changes there, it's important that you have a response mm -hmm. yeah. uh, to that. And uh, I thought I thought you do that quite nicely. And it kind of works either way. You can either sort of increase into that measure mm -hmm. or you can decrease. Yeah. I think it's optional, however you okay. feel it, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and uh, and similarly the top line of the harmony does keep rising as we'll see. Can you start one more time uh, this measure, maybe at the beginning of the bar? Uh -huh. into uh, this measure, mm -hmm. third of 177, if you're looking at the music, uh, a little bit fuller, a little bit longer into the second beat, okay. yeah. because of that chord change, it has a little bit more tension to it. Mm -hmm. Then a lot of flutists pull back the dynamic rather suddenly after that, mm -hmm. because 
of, the, again, because of the harmony relaxing a little bit in mm -hmm. the next measure. Mm -hmm. So really, if you're looking at the harmony, probably uh, the correct, so to speak, way to play it would be a little bit more um, to be still increasing a little bit, mm -hmm. yeah? crescendo a little bit longer mm -hmm. uh, keep maybe keep diminishing throughout this measure okay and I think it'll mirror the harmony mm -hmm. just a little bit better can we do it mm -hmm. okay great great maybe from here you delay the vibrato again mm -hmm. and may I, I think there are better places sure. than okay. that mm -hmm. why not when you get to the B give the vibrato come right back in simplicity in your playing, which is a very important mm -hmm. aspect. Okay. Uh, as we know, not all music is passionate, some of it is simple, mm -hmm. right? And we have to be able to do it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but, uh, so that's, a, that's a, a thing. I think that we also, uh, we really like it, the idea that the note would somehow blossom in some way, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm all for the blossoming note, so don't get me wrong. I love it just as much as everybody else. But I think the harmony has to, we have to do it with the harmony. Sure. Or the implied harmony. Otherwise, it don't make any sense. What are you blossoming about if there's no chord change? You're, not bloss you're only blossoming because, I don't know, you're so self-indulgent <laughs> that you love to blossom on everything. <laughs> when that doesn't always work, you know. So uh, those are my complaints okay. about it. So that's your ammunition to fight the battle. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. All right. Very good. Very good. Uh, all right. Lay on my drum. What are you playing first? I can do lay on TBD? TBD. Play TBD first. <laughs> Do you want? 
want the solo or the opening? Uh, it's it's like really up to you. What would you like to play? Actually, yeah. we'll do. I need help on the opening. you should totally, you know, totally sacrifice it, but maybe you should, you know. Um, can we try it again without the vibrato completely? You can, and, yeah. you know, I mean, it's going to make that very blendy sort of mm -hmm. thing that, that does, you know, it does sound very appropriate right. in the orchestra yeah. at, at that point. It's far from a flute solo. The whole thing is right. a, you know, a very complex ensemble piece. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, um, I think there's nothing wrong with playing that with without vibrato. Maybe maybe just when you start the G, maybe a bit of a, a lyrical quality right. just for the for the forte. But maybe take it out mm -hmm. and uh, it won't won't make you stick out. Even in an audition setting, you know. Um, you know, at some point you gotta demonstrate that you sound really good when you play without vibrato. Because it's such an important part of orchestral playing, of playing chamber music, of playing anything. Right. You know, we need to sound beautiful without vibrato. Uh, some of us sound 
more, more, more beautiful without vibrato than with vibrato, and that's an issue too. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think that uh, uh, that that is appropriate here. Okay. And then for the next passage, maybe you could be slightly more soloistic okay. with, yeah. with the vibrato. Um, and then the triplet passage, so much easier when you can hear the orchestra part uh, play from uh, from where you come in. I have my little accompaniment for you here. Okay, ready? Go. Again, it's another excerpt that's totally fun in the orchestra. When you play right. it in an audition, it's a pain. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you need to have these little techniques, different ways of practicing it so the subdivision just becomes so second nature for you. The audition committees will be ruthless to you about it. Um, and that's just a sad fact of, of the system. Um, and. Uh, I think the same goes for uh, a little bit later and also in the book I have this sort of sketched out so that you can play um, towards the end So you can really drill that. What are the notes that they are playing? What does it sound like? And you can think of that. And it really helps keep you on track. I think it's better than just counting one, two, three, four, five, which is okay too. But um, uh, anyway, um, how soft can you get the end, by the way? Oh, I think it's softer. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think the pianissimo, to be totally picky, I think it's a little bit, it was a little bit too much mm -hmm. this time. Okay. Uh, sometimes I like to use this fingering. It's forked F with the C sharp. Forked F. It's possible yeah. to get it really, really soft. Yeah. I find. Yeah, okay. for sure. So, uh, just a little trick fingering for for playing F really, really, really soft when you have to go to the limit with it. Um, 
having said all that, I, I think it's good. Can, is it possible for you in the, trip, in the previous triplet passage also to maybe stay a little bit softer? Uh, Maybe try for singing piano, singing pianissimo, right. if you will. It shouldn't sound like you're uh, working too hard for it, but, you know, <laughs> I thought it was a little bit too loud. Yeah. Anyway, you obviously know it extremely well, and if I heard that behind the screen, I would think, well, that player obviously really knows uh, this piece, and that's fantastic. So I would be sort of driven to pick away at these little tiny right. things, but that's what, what they will do. Yeah. So, uh, but anyway, bravo to you on that. Um, should we? Maybe we should move on to TBA. Well, yeah, um, I know we talked about Daphnis. Do you want to hear Daphnis again? It, it's really, it's really your, you know, it's your game. I'm gonna do fine then. Do fine. No one's done that. Great. Sort of pushing the limit on softer. Okay. I told you, I thought you were a little too loud. Yeah. Um, and uh, you can't even use your metronome 
for this start fast and then gradually start to slow it down. Mm -hmm. um, and there's going to be um, there's going to be a place where you start failing. Right. Right. Okay. And probably it won't take too long. Uh, what you do then is that you take a break. Yeah. Okay. And play some other things. Take a break from practicing. Come back later in the day. And same drill, same thing over again. Yeah. And what you have to do is to teach your body to sort of endure this, okay? Um, and you're gonna have to do some tough love on yeah. this. And um, but the idea is to get everything, a rib cage, abdomen, and everything expanded more like a barrel than ever before, okay? So all those little intercostal muscles between your, between your ribs, they all have to be all stretched out, okay? And that will allow you to accommodate more volume of air. You're using your air very well, very well, and you have good focus. There's no reason you can't do it. You can absolutely do it. Okay. okay? <laughs> um, and then, like we talked about, just try to just try to give, and this is sort of a very, I, I think a very French idea that you sort of uh, give the intensity in the phrase through sort of um, underplaying right. the phrasing, actually. You do the phrasing, yeah. but you more like imply the thing other than make a statement yeah. about it. So that way you don't lose your expression so little okay I think that's how you could describe it in yeah. a capsule right like how to do that French okay. thing um, I'm thinking a lot about that these days because we have a very very French conductor and he always wants to, us to play everything that way which is a little bit annoying but <laughs> uh, it's good for your playing anyway to play that way you know these are really cool little nuances um, and I think you could uh, sketch them a little more clearly, okay. um, especially these two. Now, Debussy uh, has this, uh, um, depending on your point of view, is either beautiful or irritating, uh, notion of rewriting crescendos and diminuendos. So it's kind of, composers don't do it too often. Uh, but you have crescendo and then uh, crescendo to what? Well, I don't know exactly, but then there's another crescendo. Uh, so, hey, wait a minute, what does that mean? Well, my understanding is it, it's a type of expressive phrasing. So at two, if you're looking at the music, you play. And so you come back right. a, a little bit with each, with each of those. Would you try it? I think it's very, very expressive way of playing. More, you need more sound here. Yeah, yeah. You make more sound. Remember the strings are... Right. The I'm strings are sawing right away right. there, like yeah. soloists. And you have to punch through. Right. Yeah. Uh, you always have to play forte there. In your audition, maybe don't play forte. Play mezzo forte. Okay. Okay. It has to be full enough that the audition committee is commit uh, convinced that you are going to still be the soloist okay. when the orchestra is playing there. Right. But don't force. Don't. Okay. It's not forte. Yeah. Um, you hear you can go crazier though okay. with the emotion. OK? 
Okay, right. so everything you have, more vibrato, mm -hmm. wider vibrato, you know, all that sort of thing. And then I thought this was very good, but I don't like your rhythm to be super picky. I apologize, it's two before three. I think that the 16th notes are too fast in, in your tempo. Okay. Yeah, fill out the, full, fill out the subdivision. Mm -hmm. uh, It's actually kind of a longer note right. than you're, you're actually playing. Right, yeah, I heard it. Uh, but that's, it's a small thing. It's a small thing. Yeah. Uh, I'm just saying, if I was on an audition committee, I hear it on the other side, I think, well, right. <laughs> why is the subdivision so fast? Exactly. You know, or something like that. I don't know. Right. But uh, anyway, I think you play this extremely beautifully. And uh, I think you should absolutely, you've really got it in you to do it um, beautifully and in one breath, you can absolutely do it. Again, if you work for one breath in the first phrase, don't sacrifice that expression, though, for it, okay? I mean, if you can't do it yet and you have your audition, it's fine, it's fine. Uh, then take a breath. But, uh, at, you know, play it with beautiful phrasing. I kind of like the Mysterioso approach myself. Uh, but that's just my my opinion. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Bye. Listen, I want to thank all the players uh, for coming out and playing so beautifully. I think you all really exemplified yeah, really the highest level of playing. It was yeah, really great. Really high. Yeah. And uh, Mark, I think you and I have come full circle since have our, we? I, don't know. I think since our days in the great state of Texas <laughs> to uh, St. Louis and New York City, I think we, we've done all right. So thank you for coming and sharing with us your knowledge wow, and so your expertise. Pleasure. It was really great. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, if you have any books.